So part two, the four insights. So in Buddhism, there are four major insights and all of them are interdependent between themselves. So again, they support each other and they kind of segue into each other in interesting ways. The classical three are, like in the Pali Canon, there are the three characteristics, anicca, dukkha, and anatta. Those are impermanence, suffering, and no self, respectively. And add to this the fourth, which is sunyata, or I, I, I put the, like, sunyata is folly, so that, you know, the or slang that the Buddha probably talked uh, way back and in the, which the Pali canon, the Ther, you know, Theravada Buddhism, Southeast Asian Buddhism, they, they, their holy texts are in Pali. But emptiness or, 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 or sunyata is often like a Mahayana thing. So it's more like um, more, more talked about in, in, in the north. So like in China, like in Zen Buddhism, for example, or Chan Buddhism, which is Chinese Buddhism, and Tibet and so on. So I also put here the Sanskrit sunyata. Okay. Anyway, so like if I have P or S, that means like, you know, P after something is, it means it's in Pali and S is in, in Sanskrit. But yeah, sunyata is empty. And all of these four insights have different grades of depth. So one can understand them in, let's say, shallower and, or, or, and deeper ways. The shallow is kind of like, hmm, maybe it's a bit too kind of, um, too much weight there. It's kind of, you know, I don't know what the word would, would be, but it's, it's kind of unfair to the shallower interpretations. So shallow is the wrong word, but let's say there's different layers to these insights. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm going to go over these like now one by one. First, impermanence. So permanence or Nietzsche, at, it, at, at the most superficial level, is the fact that all composite phenomena in reality, so all things that are composed of other things, like me, like all of you, like the chairs or whatever you're sitting on, like the mountains, whatever, all of those are, so, go, are going to sooner or later fall apart. So, you know, even mountains crumble. Everything's going to fall apart. Any object you can see, like my speaker, my microphone, whatever, all of it is going to fall apart. And accordingly, any and all things we hold dear are things we will eventually lose. So loved ones, careers, cars, houses, relationships... All of that will break down. You will lose it eventually. Even if it's only at your own death, you will lose it. All composite objects break down. All of them falter. And for this reason, for example, in Theravadan funerals in um, Southeast Asia, they chant Anichavata Sankaro Padavetamino Pajitvani Rujanti Te Sankupa Samotuko. All composite phenomena. Sankara is a word which, by, by the way, we'll, we'll talk about more. It's a very interesting word in Buddhism. But in here, it me, here it means composite objects. All composite objects are impermanent. They arise, there are things that arise and fall. They rise just to be destroyed, and um, relinquishing them is the greatest bliss. It's, uh, it's an interesting thing to say at funer funerals. It's, it's a very Buddhist thing for sure. I like it, uh, which is why I put it there. Another subtler level of impermanence uh, we can understand to mean that all material things stay only apparently the same for even a moment. That actually all things are vibrating, all things are in flux. So it's not just that the mountain eventually crumbles or that your, love, your spouse is going to die or like, you know, like I'm going to break down or my mic is going to break down, but actually everything vibrates all the time in, in, in a way like, like that they actually change completely all the time. Everything is in flux. So here, say, for example, atoms are exchanged with the air. They change place. Elementary particles decay, turn into, into each other, etc. Whatever. Nothing stays the same for even a moment. If I look at my hand, it looks to me like there's a, an object there that's solid and, and sustained and stable. But actually, you know, its its parts are changing all the time. Blood is coursing there. There's nerve impulses. There's all kinds of transference changing place going on. It's changing all the time. So what is it? What is the hand? This is the you know in 
in Western philosophy, someone might know like that's the ship of Theseus, which is kind of the same thing. We change parts of something. Um, at what point does it stop being the same? So you know, if, if, it, if you have a ship and you change its parts and, and you move its like uh, replace its parts one one after the another with new parts, at what point is it not the same ship anymore? And you know. So one answer to it is that you know the minute something you change one part of it, it's really not the same ship. It, it, it's it's composed of different things. It's not the same. So you know, like, yeah, on a cognitive level, we can understand this. Nothing says is the same thing even for a moment. So like you know, this is kind of this ties into into emptiness. Uh, usually, when we, when we talk about, talk about sunyata or emptiness, people say something like you know. That emptiness means that things are empty of self-nature or self-existence. And here, you know, the point is that in this inter- interpretation of impermanence, it's that, you know, things are empty of their self-nature in the sense that no enduring object can be found. Everything changes all the time, so nothing really exists. I mean, what the hell is a hand? You know, what is my hand if it's, it's co- continuously changing? What is it? And where is it? Okay, an even deeper level of impermanence concerns experience itself. So at this level, it's not just with that we cognitively know, due to, you know, physics or whatever, that everything is changing. <clears throat> Sorry, we actually perceive it happening in our own experience. So, for example, there's this contemplation, or like this um, insight practice of observing change in everything, where you basically take change as your object of meditation. And you observe change in all your sensory fields at the same time. If you do that and you're concentrated enough, what usually tends to happen is that things start jiggling in a, in a sense. Everything starts feels like it's moving, it's changing, and it's changing at such a rapid pace that it feels like everything is actually, the minute it arises, and the minute something happens, it changes into something else. The minute something arises, the second, the moment something arises, it passes away into something else. Yeah, if, if if one does this, one can see firsthand that no phenomenon is still, even for a moment. All sensations, all sounds, all everything, all everything changes continuously. Nothing is still, even for a moment. So there really is nothing solid, no, nothing sustained there to be found. If you listen to a sound, even something that feels to you like, like a monotonous thing, there's going to be a fluctuation there. Every single moment it's changing into something else. And when it's changing into something else, it's different. It's not the same sound anymore. The next moment, it's not the same sound anymore. All the time it's changing. And so rapidly that there is no moment in time in which it is the same. It's actually in a constant state of change, of flux. So there is basically, at this level of understanding impermanence, there's just change. There's nothing else. It's an unfolding, a becoming. And furthermore, nothing is, beco- is becoming out of something into something else. There's no past or future. It's not a process of, you know, that there was something and then it's going to be something because there's only the present moment. If you observe your experience, you can't find the past or the present anywhere. Beyond, behind the present, there's nothing. There's an emptiness, a void, nothing. In front of the present moment, an emptiness, a void, nothing. If you observe change in this way, usually, yeah, first things start jiggling, everything feels like it's changing, and if you do it even longer, it starts feeling like the present moment is just a kind of like a sheet of paper that's only becoming. It's just an extremely thin, feather-light, paper-thin, constant becoming of nothing becoming into nothing. There's nothing more than change. There's nothing there. So, yeah. Things pass away as soon as they arise. Nothing is to be found anywhere. And this is one perspective, one gateway into sunyata, into emptiness. This is one way how impermanence, insight into impermanence, segues into insight into emptiness. Nothing has self-existence because there's nothing to be found if you look carefully enough. Only change. Okay, suffering. 
suffering, dukkha, suffering or unsatisfactoriness. Uh, Thani Sarabiku, for example, he's like one big, big uh, Western teacher. He translates, translates dukkha as stress, which works in some, some situations, but stress is a bit an unsatisfactory translation, let's say. Um, suffering is the traditional one, and let, let's stick to that, because, you know, the, the problem with suffering is that uh, people, it sounds too dramatic, you know. It's like such something big, like you're in monumental anguish, you're dying, you know, really kind of, you know, tearing your heart out. But actually, what, what's pertained here is suffering in a very, also in a very subtle level. There can be suffering so that you don't even notice it. It's so subtle, it's so small, but it's there, and it's painful. It's still suffering. So I'll stick to suffering here. So yeah, suffering pretty much pertains to the ultimate, the unsatisfactory nature of all phenomena. No phenomenon will keep you satisfied forever. So like, like some sharks, and this is a factual thing, not all sharks, but some sharks have to keep moving com- continuously to stay alive because they don't, their uh, like gills get, like they get oxygen, like uh, they don't have any pumping uh, muscles in their gills. They have to move so that the water flows into their gills and they get oxygen. In the same way, humans usually require more and more sustenance. And sustenance, I, I'm not writing here very much about sustenance, but sustenance is a, is a good key word to think about, an insightful thing to think about. All people get sustenance from somewhere. And by sustenance, I don't mean here food, or like material sustenance. I mean emotional sustenance. Sustenance in this way means those things that make you feel like you're okay. Life is okay. Life is all right. There are the things that in the balance of like, does life suck or, or not? Is everything terrible or not? Am I a bad person or not? Sustenance is the thing that t- tilts the balance towards, I'm okay, I'm a good person, life is good, life, the world is a nice place to be, there's meaning in life. That's sustenance. And for some people, sustenance can be video game. You know, I've been there at least many, many times. I have a work day, I'm kind of, I'm feeling kind of shitty, and then I, I remember, ah, oh, I have that video, video game when I go back home, oh, I love it. And then I feel fine again, I'm like, you know, I have something to look forward to, everything's fine. That's sustenance. For some people it might be drugs, they're like, you know, ah, oh, you know, addicts, definitely, you know, like, like they feel terrible until they know, like, oh, I can have my next fix. Wonderful, everything's okay. For some people it might be something perhaps more beneficial, like generosity. They feel like, you know, like uh, uh, when they give money to beggars, they feel like, you know, ah, okay, I'm a good person. Yeah, nice. And so on. And sustenance can, can take many, many forms. Many, many forms. But the thing here is that no single thing can give you permanent sustenance. You will require more unless you really fix the key, the core problem there. Basically, one way to view awakened beings who are entirely enlightened, which I am not, for the record, one way to, way, way to think about them is in terms of sustenance. Arahants, perfectly enlightened ones, they have decided once and for all that life is okay, the world is okay, there's no questions unanswered. There's, well, like, there's a lot of questions unanswered, but most of those questions are just, you know, not worth answering. They 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 don't. They're not really really questions. They're just illusions. They have resolved that they're fine. The world is okay. I am okay. Everything is fine, as it is, and they no longer require sustenance. That's one of the ways to, uh, in in my understanding, in my mind, how to put the end goal of the path. You no longer require emotional sustenance. That would be wild and very very cool. It would free all of your resources into doing good. That would be nice. But yeah, uh, in, in terms of dukkha, yeah, the idea is, you know, nothing gives you permanent sustenance. You'll always feel like shit anyway. Or like, that's maybe putting it in kind of rough words, but you, you will, you will feel, feel a, a need for something else. You will feel a need for change, for, for some signal that everything is okay and that you're on track and, you know, like your life is on track and so on. Um, so, yeah, all composite things fail. They're on itch, they're impermanent, they will be destroyed. But they also turn stale. 
So however rich you are, however loved you are, if you don't change your mind itself and find its happiness inside, you will never ever be happy for more than a, just a fleeting moment. And here I say just a fleeting moment because all of us, like many of us can maybe say this, yeah, I have been happy for more than a fleeting moment, yeah. But that is probably the result of, of your insights into this. That's the result of you feeling like, yeah, like, yeah, like you're requiring less sustenance. There's grades to this. People who are, are happy for a long time at a stretch, well, some people might just get lucky. They get a lot of, you know, whatever. They just get a lot of sustenance out of nowhere, and they, they don't have lack. They don't face that emotional lack. And they, it's not insight. For most people, if they're happy for a long time at a stretch, it's because they have, they have kind of resolved to some degree that life is fine. I mean, this is fine. I don't know what this whole thing is about. Maybe it's not about anything, and it doesn't have to be about anything. And it's just fine. Let's just allow it to be as it is and just live life. And that would be the result of insight. That, that's insightful. You're more satisfied. And you require less sustenance. But if you don't have that insight, any of, any of that insight, you'll just, just be happy for just a moment, and then you, know, you, you require more. My brother, who is a bit of an existentialist, once put it in this, this, this way, that's, you know, or like his view of life is that you have a, you're alone, in, and this is a very <laughs> pessimist view, and this is, you know, something he said once, but, it's, but it struck me. He said that life is such that you're alone in a forest, in a forest path, and you have, you have breadcrumbs, or like you have, you have something nice in your hands, and you throw it a bit further on the path, and then you look at it, ah, there's something nice there. And then you go and you pick that nice thing up. And then you see that, ah, it's the same thing. Yeah. And then you throw it again a bit further on the path. You walk it, ah, there's something nice. And then you pick it up, pick it up. Ah, it's the same boring thing again. It get, you have a moment of pursuit. You know, I'm going to get something nice. And then you notice that, you know, it's nothing. It's just the same old thing. It doesn't make me happy. Yeah, and that's, I think, a good picture of, uh, of an unhappy life, in a sense. That doesn't have much. Of course, the, 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 as he said this, he, he, this, um, I, he, he, said, he said this portrayal, or like he related it to me, was perhaps some uh, sign of insight into, into these, these same things. And my brother is uh, doing better nowadays, for the record, so. No. Anyway. Yeah, leaning on the composite phenomena will eventually leave you unsatisfied and suffering again. At a deeper level, again, many layers to these, we can notice that the push and pull of the mind is actually constant. At nearly every moment in time, we are trying to push something away or pull something toward us. So we're constantly trying to change things. And this is continuous. It's happening all the time. It's not always external, it can be just internal, but there's, it, it's happening all, all the time, all the time. Maybe not every second, in some flow states, maybe not so much, but it's there like pretty much all the time. The mind is constantly unsatisfied on a subtle level with what is, and is trying to make it into something else. And this is suffering at a deep level. It can be subtle. It can be non-conscious, not very explicit. But it's there. And this suffering is called craving. Tanha in Pali. It's Trishna in Sanskrit, but let's use the Pali here. So it has these four forms, you know, it's a basic analysis. It's craving for something pleasant that is absent to become present. You know, there's something pleasant that I don't have and I want to have it. Craving for something pleasant that is present to remain present, you know. There's something pleasant and I have it and I want to, that I, you know, to keep it. Craving for something unpleasant that is absent to remain absent, you know. I know that there's something nasty and that feels bad that's not here and I really hope to, by God, may let it not come back. You know. And then there's craving for something unpleasant that is present to become absent. I feel bad. I'm in pain. There's a terrible situation. I'm anxious. I'm triggered. I want it to go away. 
All of that's craving. All of that. Tanha literally means thirst. So it's, it's, so it's th- like and the reason why the Buddha used the word tanha is because thirst is so strong. It's such a strong craving. Like, you know, if, if you're thirsty, you're dehydrated, or, you know, you're being without water for days in the desert, all you can think about is water. Now, a craving doesn't always take that form, but it can be pretty pretty, pretty strong, even with like some seemingly insignificant things or like irrational things. Yeah. So suffering three. And this leads us to one part of what's called dependent origination. We'll get to that later. Some people might recognize this. But craving leads to clinging, upadana, where the mind fabricates a kind of, of, of subtle narrative of selfhood in relation to the craved object. So then you have, see, you have these emotions and thoughts. <clears throat> I need this. I want this. I hate this. I want this to go away. This is in, is on, is in a position to me. This supports me, whatever. Your mind starts fabricating this narrative. It m- might not be in like discursive thoughts, but you can, it, it, even in, on, on an emotional level, you can recognize the narrative, you know. There's a situation which your mind recognizes I need this. Like, this thing disturbs me. So, there's a me there. Clinging leads to becoming, bhava, and becoming leads to birth, jati. And this is the birth and maintenance of a sense of self, of someone dependent on some external circumstance, and it's the birth of someone who is suffering. So, on a subtle level, there's this dynamic where you crave, which leads to clinging, and clinging leads to, you know, this is mine, I have this, like, I don't have this, I want this, I don't want this. And, it, and when that happens in your mind, your mind starts utilizing in its processes, again, the variable of me, the variable of I, it starts creating a bigger and bigger narrative of me needing this, me in relation to this, and then selfing starts getting stronger, selfhood is strengthened. And you can notice this actually if you if you're if you're very acute, you look very carefully. When you're anxious or you're threatened, you feel threatened or, or whatever, you feel much more separate from others and from the from, from the rest of reality. You feel much more like there's someone behind your eyes. There's you. That's kind of like in trouble. I'm in trouble. Like I'm I'm socially anxious now. I'm separate from these people. I have to do better. I have to be something else, and so on. The sense of self is stronger, more robust, more noticeable. It's a good med- meditation technique, for, especially for ad- advanced like, adept meditators, to start observing the sense of self. What's called the, the raw sense of self. How much do you feel directly like you are you? You are someone. And you are separate. Anyway, yeah. Then with the quenching, quenching of craving... There's the quenching of suffering. This is the classical Buddhist. Uh, it's the third noble truth. And the four noble truths, I won't speak about them more here or I can on the slide, but the four noble truths of Buddhism are first, there's su- there is suffering. And suffering can be hella subtle. You know, it can be really subtle. The second noble truth is that craving leads to suffering. Basically, craving is the problem that leads to suffering. Third noble truth is that the cessation of craving leads to the, the cessation of suffering. And the fourth noble truth is how the hell do you actually get rid of craving? It's the path that leads to, to the uh, elimination of craving. And that's the eighth, eightfold noble path. That's the Buddhist path. That's a separate discussion. I won't go into that. But the fourth noble truth, you know, like uh, classically, you know, in Buddhism, the way to get rid of tanha is. The Eightfold Noble Path, you can Google it, whatever. Right view, right thought, right intention, whatever. Like there's this right livelihood, right action, so on. Anyway, so craving itself rests ultimately on ignorance, which is avidya, which is a set of very deeply ingrained beliefs about ourselves in reality, as well as what makes us happy. So what leads to the mind to crave certain things is actually already existing conceptions about the self. There's a kind of feedback loop here. Clinging reinfo- creates and reinforces selfing and a sense of self, but clinging, which rests on craving, 
uh, actually like via craving also already rests on conceptualizations about the self. It's a vicious circle that just creates more and more self. The vicious circle is cut when craving is cut away. <clears throat> Sorry. And then selfing is, is slowly relinquished. It easily comes back because those concept, concepts, conceptualizations of selfhood that your mind runs and fabricates and thinks are true are pretty deeply set often. And they just kind of they restart. You get triggered. Or I, also in other situations, the selfing starts. But when you get triggered, so, so to speak, that's when the real, you know, shit hits the fan. So yeah, these are exactly the things that are enduring that they can, like uh, the beliefs about reality that kind of uh, the avidya, the ignorance that underlies craving is exactly the belief that things are enduring, that they can satisfy us, that such a, such a thing as a self can be actually found and it exists, and that things have robust self-existence. So basically what I mean here is that the ignorance that underlies craving is exactly the ant- antithesis of these four insights. It's that you don't understand impermanence. You don't understand suffering. You don't understand no self. You don't understand emptiness. That's how, from the Buddhist point of view at least, how we would view things. So no, no self. Anatta. There's, yeah, well, a bit of a typo there. But yeah, anatta pertains to the phenomenologically ascertainable fact that no matter how deep you look into your experience, no such thing as a separate self, me or I, can be found. And these are just examples. You can notice the body is not the self, for it is distinct from the sense of self. So if you look at, if you observe your body and you think of how does it feel to be you and where do you feel like you are? Most people feel like they're behind their eyes. It feels like, if you observe your body sensations, it feels like, you know, I am attending to my, the sensations in my, on my, in my hand, or I'm looking at my hand. But, you know, the hand isn't me. Like, I'm looking at the hand. It's distinct from the sense of self, so, you know, it doesn't really seem to be me. I am something different. I might own the hand, it might be my hand, but that's a different thing. It's not me, it's my hand. I'm something different. So, you know, the body sensations are distinct from the sense of self. Second point here, actions are not the self, even though we sometimes feel we own them. So here we, you can notice this, you know, even from a very uh, non-meditative or like non, let's say, non-trained perspective, we can see that, you know, the fact that, you know, I'm moving the hand and so on, I'm, uh, I'm moving the microphone or I'm drinking, drinking from my cup of tea. But you can notice that, you know, even if I feel like I'm doing it, it's not that the, the action itself isn't me. I'm doing it. So like, I feel like I'm doing it, but yeah, I'm not the action. It's something I do. In a deeper perspective, when you have this, with what we previously discussed, this no-self, persistent no-self states, like effortless states, where things just flow, you have a mindful flow that things just unfold, then you don't even feel ownership towards your actions. It's just, hap- it's just you know, your body is just another material thing doing, you know, whatever. Going to the shower, you know, like uh, talking to someone, whatever. It doesn't even feel like you. So it's even more distinct. But even without that, you can notice that, you know, actions feel like they're yours. They're not you. Thoughts are not self, or they always occur as objects of our observation. You know. If you have thoughts, you might think you might feel like I'm thinking, but when you see the thoughts, you don't feel like you're the thoughts. Or do you? If you do observe, perhaps you can look it a bit hard, like you know, a bit more about them. You know, are you really the thoughts? If you think you know the thoughts, the cat is on the mat in your head. Is the thought you, or is it just an object you observe? It's something in your mind that your mind observes. It's not really you. Sorry, I'm going through all of this. You might this might be obvious, but you know, I'm just going, going to go over all of this. Thinking is not the self, or thoughts ultimately arise out of nothingness. This is a bit more subtle. We feel like you know, often we feel like you know, I I'm the I'm the thing that's thinking these thoughts. However, if you notice the origin of those thoughts, when a thought appears, where the hell does it come from? It, it one, one moment it's it's not there and then it's just there. So and we can we can you know 
For example, you can form an intention that, you know, in three seconds, I'm going to think the thoughts, the cat is on the mat. And then in three seconds, there's the thoughts, the cat is on the mat. Aha, I made it. I was the one thinking. I thought it. However, where, where did the original intention to think the cat is on the mat in three seconds come from? You didn't premeditate it. It just came from somewhere. It just appeared. You know? Most thoughts, they just come up. And there's no premeditation. There's nothing. They just appear. You know, are you really thinking of them? Or are they just objects that your mind sends, observes? Much like your eyes perceive horns or colors. And then finally, the mind is not the self, for the source of thought is nowhere, nowhere to be found. It's ungraspable. The camera can't see the camera. We all know that. But the camera, yeah, the camera might be there. So, you know, maybe it's just that, you know, you can't grasp the mind because it's the mind itself. And here we get into what's called the true self versus no self debate. It has no, really no importance or, you know, any actual you know, results in the practice or enlightenment or whatever, which, which one you believe. But in the Vedic traditions of India, for example, for example, in Advaita Vedanta, which some might be familiar with, here it diverges from Buddhism. There the idea is that is that actually there is a, a, a mind that's everywhere and, and it's universal and that is where the thoughts come from and it does exist but it's yeah it's universal so the thing there is that, that the atman so like the, the self which in pali would be atta if you think anatta is no self the an is no atta is self or like soul in sanskrit it's atman so it would be anatman so, Vedic texts are usually in Sanskrit, so I'll just use the Sanskrit form. So, they think in Vedic traditions that there's an Atman, a soul, uh, that's the, the source of thoughts, it's the kind of like the, the, the mind, the, the source of all mind, mental things. However, in truth, the Atman is identical to the Brahman, which is a universal mind. So, actually, your true self is mind, which is universal, so it's always everywhere. In classical Buddhism, perhaps it would lean more towards, you know, there is no mind. It's just voices. There, there's nothing there. It's just phenomena. They don't come out of anywhere. They just appear out of nothingness. However, it makes no difference. It really makes no difference. And the Buddha, for the record, uh, saying that the Buddha would have endorsed that there is no self at all, that there is no self, that's wrong. Actually, there was this, uh, in the Pali Canon, an, a wanderer named, I think he was named Bacha Gotha, uh, came to the Buddha and asked, like, you know, is there a self? The Buddha said, nothing. Bacha Gotha asked, well, is there no self then? And the Buddha said, nothing. And Bacha Gotha said, is there neither self, like, is there neither self nor no self? And the Buddha said, nothing. And then he left disappointed. And the Buddha's descendant and cousin, Ananda, said that, you know, why didn't you just tell him that there's no self, you know? And the Buddha was, you know, because the per he would have misunderstood. The point is not that there is no self. The point is that the whole question is, for one, it's meaningless. And that, you know, selfhood is so beyond, like, whether there's a true self or no self is so beyond any empirical investigation, so beyond any phenomenological investigation, that, you know, it makes no difference. It just makes no difference. The Buddha isn't interested in it. He's like, no. He, he uh, if I recall correctly, like, uh, I might be mixing up suttas here a little bit, like the text forces in the Pali canon, but at least elsewhere he says, it's, you know, questions about whether the universe is infinite or eternal or not, they're just meaningless. I think he kind of, um, what's the word, like, um, compared this question of self versus true, no self versus true self to those. It's meaningless metaphysics. It no longer has, any, has anything to do with suffering or the relief from suffering. You can believe whatever you want. Universal self or no self? Is there even a difference, you know? What is the difference? Anyway, a bit of a digression. I hope you found it interesting, but like, yeah. So, 
no self too. So, selfing. The selfing is the mental phenomenon whereby the mind crafts a sense of self, and that has two main components. Me, or the sense that this, whatever it is, is me. So, for example, it could be, you know, in relation to, to uh, another uh, person, or in relation to a particular perceived quality of character of yourself. Or it could be, you know, you know, just like, you know, a feeling that, you know, this body is me. So, so if you don't observe it in that kind of way I just, just described before, that, you know, like, it's actually distinct from me and feels more like mine, you might feel like, you know, ah, yeah, our mind might have this concept or this conception that, ah, my body is me. Like, you know, whatever thing is me. It's like, you know, that's like, uh, it can be in relation to some, another, like, a, a phenomenon. Like, like bodily sensations, or in relation to a particular perceived quality of your characters, so like, you know, I am dumb, I am stupid, I am ugly, I look funny, whatever. Uh, and that's like me. But there's also the raw sense of self, which is the feeling that you're located in space, in a particular place, usually behind the eyes. And again, it can be a valuable insight practice to observe changes in that sense of self because that can get bigger or smaller you probably you might not have noticed it some if you meditate a lot and you've done this before in myself but really that sense of meanness behind your eyes and you know like between your temples roughly for most people it can change place and it can grow bigger or smaller it's interesting and that's um Observing that can get can give you insight into when are you selfing and when are you not, and why are you selfing when you when you are and why not. So, for example, again, usually when people are in anxious situations, their sense of self grows bigger. Feels like their internal, you know, quote unquote, internal world, let's say, behind their eyes and in their head is bigger in relation to the external world, like external phenomena. It's like there's a bigger world inside, more focus inside, in a sense. There's this kind of not just introspection, but like a feeling of weight and size uh, in relation to, to the, the external world. Whereas if you're in a flow state or you're just feeling okay or you're talking to someone and you're engrossed in conversation, in a good conversation, and you feel fine, it can be that, you know, the sense of self is super small, and actually the world that's opening in front of you, including the person, fills almost all of your consciousness, and it's just kind of, you're, you're immersed in that. So, yeah, and then there's, and, uh, yeah, so there's me, and then there's mine. So that's the sense of ownership in relation to, for example, the body. Yeah, my body. I feel like this is my body. Or physical objects outside the body. This is my phone. This is my computer, this is my microphone, whatever. As well as the actions. And actually this action part is pretty crucial. It's really, uh, it's a really good source of insight when it falters, like we talked before also. So ownership of actions, it's most often called the sense of agency. Even in academic papers it's called the sense of agency. And that's the feeling that, that one is the agent of one's bodily or mental actions. I am thinking, I am moving my arm. It's this raw phenomenal feeling if you move like depending on who you are and, and how much you're selfing and depending let's be honest depending on how much you have meditated and so on uh when you move your arm uh in like across your table you probably think more or less like you know i moved my arm there's this raw raw feeling there that i am moving my arm i did this action but if you're in, if you, for example, you've done jhanas, like we talked, or like you've been in deep concentration states, or you have lots of insight into, into uh, no, no self and, and, and uh, agency, uh, you feel like it's just happening. You don't, you literally don't have this feeling that you are moving your arm. Might sound funny, but it's cool. It usually feels very liberating when, when the sense of agency and ownership is, is, is let go of. Again, it might, if it's very strong, it feels like you're constantly going downhill. It's like, you know, if you watch the movie Donnie Darko, someone might have watched the movie Donnie Darko, at the end of Donnie Darko, the main character, Donnie Darko, has this kind of like, uh, this uh, kind of tunnel w- w- which he foresees like where he's going, where the, where the future is, he's like, like in a determinist way. And then the kind of the tunnel or this weird kind of energetic the rope is kind of kind of pulling him towards it, and he has no choice other than than to go there. 
It is like that, to be honest. There's like a rope that's pulling you somewhere. Like, you know, this is this is what's not, what's happening now. This is how things are unfolding. No selfing involved. You're just in a witness in a witness position, just witnessing the natural unfolding of things. And the fun thing is that nothing changes. At most things might go better. So, for example, if you're in a very no-self state, I have noticed very clearly that balance is better because a big part of physical balance is also mental interference. You know, lack of confidence in whether, you know, you know like, your, like if your balance is correct. There's this subtle energetic kind of mental stuttering that's happening in the mind when you, lo- when you, when you lose your balance. And, and when you have good balance, there's this kind of solidity in your internal presence. And if you if you have no self, if you're in a very effortless state, that balance just comes naturally. That, that, that stability just is there. There's no conscious interference. And I think I had this insight even before I was meditating, to be honest. Like I, re- I remember talking with my friends at, at, at university once that uh, with many things, conscious interference and conscious activity, trying to do something better makes it much worse. So if you're, you know, you're trying to, whatever, throw a ball or catch a ball, and then you start consciously, you know, moving your body with a sense of ownership and agency, like I am moving my body, you're going to fail. I mean, you're most like, what's happening is you're just creating unnecessary friction that's, you know, making you fail. Uh, whereas without that friction, your body might have just fulfilled, the, executed the, the intention there. So most often, selfing is friction. It creates friction, it makes us perform poorly, it's unnecessary, it's boring, it feels bad, it creates suffering, it's just, it's useless, it, it's, a, it's an illusion. It's basically an unnecessary layer of conceptualization on top of something that's unfolding naturally, and that unnecessary layer sometimes creates very bad friction. Anyway, um... Yeah, well, yeah, me and me and mine. Those are the two forms of selfing. Pretty much all all selfing is in the, I, I, I'm one of these categories. Me or mine. No self three, and there's gonna be a four still. Uh, insight to know self. Yeah, it often progresses through experiences of disentanglement between phenomena, different phenomena, and the sense of self. So yeah. Basically, things that selfing normally attaches to, <clears throat> so things that you normally feel either me or mine, uh, and, uh, and that are normally seen to necessarily involve the selfing, are suddenly perceived without the selfing. So, let's say normal people, which is a silly thing to say, but you know, normally people have this feeling that you know, when they move their hand, they feel like you know, I'm moving the hand, and they feel like this is a necessary part of the experience. It's it's real. There's a me, like, oh, I am moving the hand, and, you know, they, don't, they can't even conceive of, of, of a situation where, like, you know, they would move their hand and they wouldn't feel like they are moving the hand. It's like they feel like there's a necessary connection. They're, they're inherently linked, they're, they're somehow the same thing, like moving the hand and me feeling like moving the hand are, are somehow the same thing. Uh, and then when they have experiences that, you know... There actually is no necessary connection between the sense of self and the body, for example, body movements or thinking or agency in any way or whatever. That informs the mind more and more that selfing is actually an internally generated conceptual process. So the sense of self, the sense of me or mine, including the sense of ownership and agency, they're a separate phenomenon. So in the same way that a thought is a phenomenon, a mental phenomenon, or a feeling, an emotion, or whatever, a feeling, a bodily sensation, is a phenomenon, the sense of self and the sense of ownership is uh, is also a phenomenon. So when you move your hand and you feel like you're moving your hand, you feel the motion of your hand and you feel the ownership. But they're just two phenomena. They don't have anything to do with with each other. Like nothing other than that your mind conceptually links them together arbitrarily. Your mind fabricates a sen- sensation of ownership when you move your hand. And that has nothing to do with the movement. It's, it's just a concept your mind uses because it's used to it. And that's actually, in the, in the end, kind of harmful. 
because you know selfing and so on is the clinging and suffering and whatever last as we discussed before and we'll discuss soon more. So, so yeah, that's how it usually progresses. You notice the third kind of inherent linkage is not there. So you realize that you know, like for for for, for me, for example. Uh, for me, a big part of no self insight, like was yeah, on the re- I, in the very beginning of this retreat of this uh, sorry, this talk when I talked about my history, I talked about the Goenka retreat where I learned, learned the form jhanas, and the form jhanas led me to very deep states of no self and no agency. For me, that was like a very key point, where I suddenly had this experience that like um, I didn't feel like I was moving my body anymore. It was just just doing fulfilling my co- my intentions or like impulses automatically. And then I could do, for example, say in my head, like, you know, go to my room, go to, go to the toilet, go to the, to the shower and shake the shower curtain and then just let go and then look, observe my body doing the thing. Walking, 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 going, opening the door, going to the toilet, shaking the shower curtain. And I was doing, I, I felt like I was doing nothing else than set the intention. That experience was like one of the first where I kind of felt like, you know, okay, if I'm not doing this, what am I? You know, am I in, 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 like ever doing stuff? I have this uh, one analogy I made up a, a while ago, uh, which a simile, which might not be perfect, but I liked it. That you know, usually like it feels like the mind is um, like we could just think of the ordinary mind as a as a as an organization or a company where uh, where there are lots of people like workers who occasionally have to call each other on the phone and give each other instructions or or call like a like a central uh, uh, like kind of like a, uh, like a like a center that uh, links these calls to all the other workers there and they also feel like you know like uh, like they get their orders to do those calls from the manager there's a manager who kind of like, you know, calls them and, and tells them, them to do stuff. And everyone be, believes that the manager is the one that, that calls them, you know, like, you know, the, the manager, manager calls like, hey, you have to call work, like worker B. And then like they call worker B and then like worker B will just call someone and also gets the instructions from the manager that, you know, call worker C, whatever. And then like, you know, finally they realize that actually there's no manager and they've just been calling each other all the time. The manager didn't exist. They were all calling each other. It's a clumsy analogy. You have to work work more more at it. But the point really is kind of like, you know, there are what we could call like sub minds in the mind, which bring contents into consciousness. And many of the sub the sub minds think that there is someone like a manager or like a conductor that's that hears those thoughts, those inputs into consciousness, and then responds by saying stuff back to them or to other sub-minds. But actually, there's just the sub-minds and, and the only only ones that are listening are the other sub-minds. There's no manager, no, no, one, no manager listening, just the sub-minds. And they talk to each other. And that's, you know, might not come very clear as, as this example, but that's pretty much how I felt it to be then. I'm, I, like, the sense of self isn't necessary it doesn't do anything it doesn't it, it isn't linked to, to action you know what action just happens even without it if it doesn't do anything does it exist you know what is it so for me that that was like a, a big big part where i kind of realized that the sense of self is is, is essentially an, an illusion it's just a concept that does nothing sometimes it's attached to to agent uh, to agency and action sometimes not Sometimes it attaches to thoughts, sometimes not. It's all about how the mind perceives itself. But that's just a perception. There's nothing there except a conceptual perception, an idea. Uh, yeah, there's like uh, there's this chasing the witness thing here, the, the second lowest uh, line. Uh, there's like... Um, there's, this is one inside practice for, for no self that, that's sometimes used. Is uh, you know basically you try to look at you try to grasp the like who's looking, and usually what what happens like uh, is that you feel like there's like you know like like a, like like here is the is the sense of self I am here, 
and then you try to look at it, try to perceive it, and then you realize that if that you're perceiving it, so the witness has to be something else. It's actually distinct from from you because you're actually looking at it. And then you you look like you know ah, but where's the camera that's looking at this camera? And then then you kind of then you look at look at it, and then you look like you you feel that you know ah, this is it. And then again, you know, you basically just chase it back more and more and more and more again until you realize that there's actually, you know, you, you can't find it. It's ungraspable. Like the Tibetans say, you know, there's this book, uh, old book, um, uh, the songs of Milarepa. Milarepa was a great Tibetan yogi and also like a crazy wanderer kind of guy. Uh, you know, the mind is like a wisp of smoke. It's really not not nothing really and you can't grasp it it's no matter how much you try to grasp it always the ways you grasp is uh is kermit like did kermit have a question kermit's hand was in the, yes, like, like, oh. i do have a question how does this yeah. apply to hive-minded entities like termites or bees or ants i'm uh, sorry can you say again how would these subjects uh, apply to hive mind entities like a termite hill mm -hmm. or a beehive yeah, I mean, uh, this is the same thing. They're, they're really like uh, in those hive mind entities. I mean, there is no, there is no hive mind. Like there is no entity there. There is no colony that's like an agent, like a like a robust existing subject. There's just the bees, and actually, we are the same. We are a col we are a colony. Yeah, I mean, they're a society that 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 function together in a concerted way. But they're actually the society itself is. We, we could say, like in philosophical philosophical t terms, it's not a reified object. It doesn't. It's. It doesn't exist in, in an in an ontologically robust way. There is no colony. There's just the bees. But they work in unison, in a way that kind of appears a like agent like. And our so mind is the same. The illusion of a colony then. Yeah, yeah, it creates the illusion that there is a, such a thing as a colony, but actually there's just parts that work together. And it might be that the bees think that there's a colony. It might be that the, that, that the bee colony is, in, is, a, is like in the same way as us. It might be that it's a con, it's, there's a conscious field that they share, in a sense, that they kind of they communicate in, in the same conscious field. But even that is just a space. There's no colony, there's just communication. The space is a metaphor. There really is, is even no space. It's just communication. A, a space is a good metaphor for it in the sense that there's a space, but no one is the space or no one's really listening there except the, the bees. But actually, there's even no space. It's, it's just communication and nothing more. The colony has no self. There's only the bees. So I, 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 I think we agree. Yes. Okay, let's, let's let's carry on. So yeah, uh, yeah. Well, there's yeah, not nothing more in this slide. I think let's go forward. No self for this is the last slide. No self. The furthermore, selfing, which is the creation of of a sense of self, is not just illusory, but it's actually quite harmful. Yeah, like I said, you know, clinging, badana, it reinforces and creates selfing, but it's also informed by selfing. They have a mutual reciprocal connection. Craving and, craving and clinging create and reinforce self. So, for example, if I cling to ice cream, the my mental uh, this or this organism is more and more going to like strengthen the sense that I need ice cream. There's a me that needs ice cream. So, so it creates and reinforces self. But, they, but it's also critically informed by subtle conceptions of what the self needs and likes or hates and doesn't like. So, for example, if I already have a conception that I am a self and I, li and I like ice cream, then when I, I'm faced with ice cream, that, that is what cre pretty much fires up the craving. You know, ah, ice cream. Ah, I'm the person who needs ice cream. Fire up craving. And then, like, when I, when I you know, if I don't get the ice cream or I must cling to it, you know, like, I really need ice cream, which further strengthens the, the sense that I'm a person who needs ice cream. I'm a self who needs ice cream. So yeah, there's a feedback loop there. The whole project of craving and clinging is ultimately founded on an idea of a self that is in contrast to the rest of reality also. So it's, you know, like, like there's a, essentially requires a, a feeling that there is me that's separate from others. and I need things. And this creates an kind of 
necessary opposition between me and the rest of reality. I need things from the rest of reality. I need things, and sometimes I have to take them by force. Sometimes I have to steal, lie, I have to buy. I really need that stuff, uh, and the world has to give it to me. So without craving and clinging, selfing could no longer be sustained, because craving and clinging, basically, the birth of self comes through the clinging. But without selfing, neither could craving and clinging. So it's either like, you know, if you remove selfing or you, or you, re- you remove craving and clinging, both of them, they collapse. The whole mass collapses. We'll get to this also later. Emptiness. Emptiness one. So emptiness, yeah. Sunyata or shunyata. It's often like briefly explained as the idea that nothing as self exists. And then it's again an insight with many subtler and subtler layers. One relatively superficial layer is interdependence. Many of you have heard this probably, and have thought of this. Nothing as self existence in the sense that everything is profoundly interdependent. Whatever object you can observe in the world, including your own body and mind, is the cause result of basically everything else in the universe. Causal connections are infinitely intertwined. So basically, if we take you, your body, and a random cockroach in, in Taipei, in Taiwan, you aren't, you aren't perhaps right now very intimately correct, co- connect causally, but we don't have to go very far back in time in causal connections before you have a shared causal basis. It's, everything is so radically connected that you know, not, none of us is very far from each other in terms of causes and conditions. Furthermore, if you would take even one atom out of the reality, just like create a void, a complete void, there's no antimatter, no matter or anything, that would create problems. I mean, every atom is in some sense required for reality to function in the way it, it functions and is. A slightly deeper way, view of interdependence is that whatever object you can observe it doesn't only originate as a part of infinitely intertwining causal connections, but it's actually maintained moment to moment by those connections. And nothing you see could exist in a void. So, for, for example, yeah, one view of interdependence is that, you know, you, you, you and your, your food, uh, or like you, let's say you, your body was created by, as a part of an infinite causal network, an infinite, it's, it's mind-bogglingly infinite. You could never, ever, a computer, even the best computers would never, ever calculate the causes and conditions for your origination. They're so super, super complicated, and they go back to the Big Bang and so on. However, it's not just your, your origination. You are continuously maintained by everything else in the universe. There's again a massively complicated causal network that maintains you in this moment. There's exchange of molecules in the air. There's you know air pressure that that, that keeps you in you know literally in shape. There's like a bunch of stuff you know every piece of food or every drink you take is so super connected to everything else. If we would place you in a complete void, you would literally explode. You can't exist without other things. You you are you necessarily require causal like uh, other like uh, like maintenance basically. Yeah, and this also holds for everybody and mind. Like I said, that reinforces no selfness. But this is pretty superficial notion of emptiness. Like some some say that this is enough. You know that this is what what it means. Nothing has self existence because everything is interconnected. Nothing can exist by itself. But actually, it goes deeper. So, a somewhat deeper layer of emptiness is that things don't only lack self-existence in the sense of being interdependent, but they don't actually exist at all. Every composite object changes all the time. We talked about this with, with Anicca. It does not remain the same even for an instant. Yeah. Everything is so supremely impermanent that objects can't be said to exist to begin with. This is actually a concrete experience. This is not just, you know, conjecture. If you do impermanence practice a lot, if you observe change very acutely and concentratedly in, in, your, in your whole sense sphere, the experience is there. You notice that everything changes so supremely fast that literally 
the, the experience is that everything passes away the moment it arises. There is not a moment where it exists. There's nothing there. In that sense also, there's no self-existence. Not even atoms, nothing. Nothing exists for even a moment. So in that sense, you know, deeper layer, layer, layer of emptiness, nothing exists. So yeah, like I just said here, yeah, phenomenal observation, every single phenomenon in the experience passes away the moment it arises. There's not an eye blink in between, everything dies the moment it is born. But hey, however, you can't say that they don't exist either. They are so radically impermanent that they are beyond existence or non-existence. There's nothing there, and there never was for those terms to apply to. So, you know, reality, thusness, it's called tathata, it's literally thusness. Tatha is thus or such. You can say, call it suchness or whatever, but thusness or suchness, reality, it's beyond the concepts of, of, of existence or non-existence. Whatever you can point to is beyond existence or non-existence. It changes so rapidly that there's nothing there to talk about. If we talk about something, we conceptualize, we make up a fantasy world. If you look at your experience carefully, it changes so fast that, you know, any name you could give anything is just a name. It's, it's a fantasy. But we're all living in a fantasy world of our own creation. Yeah. That's something we kind of want to go past and look, look through because that fantasy world is full of suffering which we create for ourselves, again. Thanks for the thumbs up, by the way. So, someone could say that, okay, still, yeah, that maybe things exist as processes of some kind. You know, they change. Maybe they're like, you know, my body changes all the time, maybe, but maybe it's like a process, you know. It's not an object, it's a process. And here it's good to elucidate this very important term called Sankara. Sankara as a term, it's used in many different contexts in the suttas and in commentaries and how people talk about Buddhism, many different ways. You know, there's like translations like it's a composite object, which would be, you know, you know like a Sankara would be a chair, for example. It's a composite phenomenon, so it might be the appearance of a chair. It's volitional formation is something that's used. I don't even know what that, that's supposed to mean, you know. But the one translation that seems to fit all the different ways is fabrication. Sankara is, is a fabrication. It's something that the mind conceptually creates into being in its own fantasy world, but that is not actually out there. So Sankara, like, there's a reason why it's also translated composite object or composite phenomenon, but the early translators had it wrong. They thought that Sankara meant Actually, you know, like a table ex really exists out there, and it's a, it's a sankara, it's, it's a composite object. But no, sankara means, like basically the, the insight there is that um, whenever you see something as a thing, like I would look at my monitor here, I don't have a VR headset, so I have a monitor. When I look at the monitor here, and I, dele I delineate it from the rest of reality, and I name it, there's a monitor. And that's a composite phenomenon, that's a composite object. It's my conceptualization that there is such a thing as a monitor, even though that's completely arbitrary and, and, and anthropocentric or egocentric. Actually, it's con continuously in, you know, interchange, interchanges atoms, whatever stuff like with, the, with the, you know, its uh, environment. The connections it has to its environment are just as robust as the connections it, it has to itself. They're really, you know, like uh, uh, like trying to name such a thing as a monitor here and seeing that composite object, it, it's a fantasy. The same holds for the body. You know, seeing the body as a process, it's a fantasy. I'm creating fantasy, and that's a composite object. That's a Sankara. So let's go forward with this. So yeah. Yes, I hear say here the same thing. Composite objects are an example of sankara. They don't actually exist. We just take a part of reality that is in constant flux, and we see it that part as an enduring object. However, processes are also sankara, since delineating a single process, such as the process of santuing. My name, of course, again is santu. The process of santuing, which would be like me. Delineating that from the rest of reality is ultimately arbitrary and anthropocentric, and there's no, there are no real physical boundaries there. There's no real objective 
measure to, to delineate this process from any other process. My teacher, Lee Brasington, he has this, he's doing a book called, uh, basically the, the working name is Soda Pie, which means streams of dependently arising processes interacting. <laughs> streams of dependently arising processes interacting. He's going to change the title, I'm sure, but like, you know, Soda Pie is a fine, fine uh, acronym. And, uh, and so the idea is that, you know, like, reality is actually just streams of different processes that, that arise interdependently and they interact. But even Lee, um, even Lee says in, in the book, you know, don't cling to the streams. There are no streams of processes. You can't delineate one process, one stream from another. They're all so profoundly interconnected that, you know, it's just one big process. You cut out a part of it. Fantasy world, Sankara. Yeah, processes are much too porous to be delineated. They too are empty. They have no, no, they don't exist. You don't have a process of sun doing. It's a fantasy. It's just a concept. Emptiness yeah, five. Yeah, and at this point, some say that yeah, there are no processes. There are just colors and sounds and bodily sensations, etc. You know, the world. You know, all that that is there are just colors and so on. But actually, no, no, no. Colors too are some car. They're they're just concepts. There is no yellow. There is no red. There is no green. Leaves aren't green, the sky isn't blue, sounds are high or low. There are no trees, there are no chairs, there's no brown. The frog here, which we would call red, and then the chair here, which we would call like uh, yellowish brown, they're actually, you know, the frog isn't red, the chair isn't yellowish brown. Whenever we make that distinction, we create concepts. All, all distinctions are concepts. Whatever you try to say about reality, you are fantasizing. You're delineating, you're cutting a part out, you're making contrasts. And contrasts are always based on concepts. This is emptiness at its deepest level, and it's very difficult to, to, to grasp without like, first-hand experience. All that there is, is thusness. All you can say about reality, all you can do is point at it, that you, know, gest you can gesture, it's such. Something is happening, it's such. But the minute you delineate something, you make concepts. And concepts aren't real. They don't exist. There is, there is no such thing as yellow. There's just suchness. This is difficult to grasp, I'm sure. Like, it, it might sound silly, but you know, when you have the experience of those concepts falling away, and you, rela you relax at, in, into that, it's, it's wonderful. And... and, and and I would kind of, it might say sound preposterous or pompous, but, but then you get it. There's nothing there. There's just such. Oh yeah, like I say here, whenever you see a distinction in reality, whenever you name a part of reality as something, like yellow, you conceptualize. Conceptualizations aren't out there. They come from the mind. They are names. They are Sankara. They are fabricated. And all this holds for any kind of meaning as well. So whatever meaning, whatever meaning you apply to reality, is just conceptualizations and names. Meanings are sankaras. Names are sankaras. Nothing means anything. No nothing is anything. There are no objects. There is no meaning. But this is, this is a, 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 incredibly important. This is where people often like. Uh, when they have, there's this thing called the Dark Night episode, a Dark Night of the Soul. It's a Christian term that's applied in Buddhism. It's it's a bit misappropriated, I think. Like you know, it's a Christian term. We shouldn't use it in Buddhism, but they but they use it. A Dark Night. That's when insight, a person gains insight into, for example, no self or impermanence or dukkha or whatever. But it's kind of half baked, and they start veering into nihilism. They start, for example, f feeling that you know. Everything is meaninglessness. Uh, meaningless. Why should I do anything? You know, all of that stuff. And they think that that's kind of like you know that that's that's the, the direction that they're going. But actually, you know, it would be equally wrong to say that nothing exists, because you know, reality again, it's beyond the concepts of existence and non-existence. It's all tathata. It's all just suchness. And finally, like I think I have in the, same, the next slide, which is why I'm waiting for the points. Yeah. 
Emptiness is not nihilism. Extremely importantly, emptiness is not nihilism. Nihilism, which is the wrong kind of meaninglessness that people veer into, it's actually a negative attribution of meaning to reality. Nihilism, uh, an anxious nihilism, is where a person looks at reality and says that this sucks. This does. This is meaningless in the sense that that's a bad thing. They attribute this badness. It's somehow wrong. It lacks something that it should have. It's 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 faulty somehow. It, it's it's anxiety inducing. All of that is attrib- attribution attribution of meaning. But re- really, you know, the right kind of uh, meaninglessness. Like which is like emptiness. It's the lack of any attribution of meaning to reality. An experience of emptiness is a falling away of conceptualization, and the end result is extremely relaxed and blissful. Emptiness is the final conquest of good over evil, because when there is no good or evil, the end result is good. Let me explain this. Also, by by, perhaps I will relate on a personal experience. With, let's see. I'll explain this. Uh, do you have a question, by the way? Um, no, I was just in thought, but uh, I guess I could explore that thought to you guys. So, um, with the law of polarity and the concept of good or evil, especially within the uh, subject of nihilism and emptiness, could you say that viewing emptiness as a good thing or as a bad thing is also an illusion? Uh, yes, I mean, there is no good or bad. Buddhist practice is not good or bad. I mean, of course, we think that, you know, it's a good thing to do and so on, but that's just fantasy. That's against Sankaras. And, you know, it's skillful means we can't get to emptiness without motivation. And because we are what we are, we have to conceptualize good and bad, and we have to conceptualize useful and useless and so on. But like, like in that, like in Buddhism, a very central point is, yeah, skillful means there's this thing called like a very... Uh, famous simile of the raft where the Buddha says that, you know, uh, like basically asks, if there's a torrent, like a, a river, and you have to get across, and you have a raft, uh, and you go over the river river with the raft, do you keep on co- like um, uh, carrying the raft on your head or like on your shoulders after you've gone across, or do you just leave it aside? And the point is that, you know, all of this is just like me a means to get over the river, uh, like all the conceptualizations of good, use, useful, you know, practice, whatever. And then when you go over the raft and you realize that, that you, you, you can let go of that meaning, you just, you just throw it away. I mean, it's just, it's just a view. Don't cling to views. And I mentioned this, like, uh, let me explain also, also this kind of to the end, this, um, this conquest of, 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 uh, of, of good over, over evil. Basically, this means, you know, there is no good or evil. Nothing is good or evil. All of that is meaning. It's not in the world. I mean, it's not in suchness. You can't see good or evil. It does not exist. However, the thing is that when you really relinquish all of that conceptualization, the end result is relaxed. And Nagarjuna, Nagarjuna was a really big Mahayana like a, a teacher. Nagarjuna is basically one of the, after the Buddha, one of the most famous Buddhist teachers, and some of here prob- most likely know about Nagarjuna. Nagarjuna said this very well. Um, I actually, I really want to find the, the actual citation. I can't remember it word from word. I remember how it starts, but it's, it's very nice. Um, captures at this point. Just a moment, because like, I have it up here. Um, yeah. Yeah, here it is. It is all at ease, not conceptualizable by mental conceptualizing, incommunicable, inconceivable, indivisible. And what I love about this is, especially the beginning, it is all at ease. And that's how it feels. I had this experience once when uh, I was walking on the street. My girlfriend had given me a new hat, and I don't normally wear hats. And I had the, uh, like, one, a jogger came, like, uh, you know, um, like, uh, you know, on the same street. And I thought, that, you know, I had this thought, do I look funny in this hat? And then suddenly I had this realization that, you know, what the hell is looking funny? Like, where, where is it? Like, what does it mean to look funny? It's just a weird thing in my mind, you know, like a, like a, like a social 
social construction in, in some sense that isn't even between people, but just my image of a what I think is a social construction. And, you know, what the hell is that image? Does it exist anywhere? And the whole thing started breaking down. And then I started lo- looking like, you know, there were trees trees uh, around. I was like, what are trees? Like, what are leaves? Like, like what the hell? Like, what is a tree? There's just that thing there. Like, like if I if I see it as a tree, it's it's just, you know, it does a disservice to it. it it's a... It's a concept, and like the concept started falling away very rapidly, like more and more and more, until like I felt like you know there's there's nothing, there's nothing, there's there's just this uh, nothing there, just this, and I and I felt such a huge sense of relief. I felt such a massive sense of bliss and exaltation, and just like this massive relief that everything. Like Nagarjuna said, everything is at ease. It is as it is. It can't be any other way. I mean, it can't be any other way. It is just as it is, and it's such. And there's nothing more to it than than such. And that's experience, you know, because it was so profoundly relaxed and so profoundly... <laughs> At ease, you know, like everything is primordially fine because it can't be any other way than it is, which is such. It's difficult to put into other words, but like it was so funny also to see that, you know, beyond all that good and evil, beyond all that conceptualization, it's so wonderful that everything is just as it is and it is at ease. Like Nagarjuna says, is it, at, it is at ease, beyond conceptualization, incommunicable, inconceivable, indivisible, but at ease. And so, even if we go past all conceptualizations of good and evil, nothing, no moral, no, no right, no wrong, nothing, still, in the end, the, the, the null result is positive. And that's incredibly, uh, that, that affected me incredibly, because it eliminated this struggle of, you know, are things really good or bad, and what is that? It was just, you know, I don't care, that that whole debate doesn't exist, and still everything is fine. That's called primordial goodness, in, in some, some traditions. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very, very nice, and it's very reassuring. I'm not sure if, if this answered your question, but I wanted to kind of also explain this, uh, this, what I mean by this conquest of good over evil. It's not a conquest of good over evil, but it, it, it's, it's that the null state is positive. And that, that's also, I think, why in the Tibetan tradition, uh, it's said that uh, emptiness is ultimately compassion. Because that re- relaxed state, I felt that it nat- very naturally, you know, suchness, my experience of suchness, my organism, this flow, like naturally turned to to joy and helping and compassion because what is there to do like what happens when when you're free and you're joyful and there's nothing that bothers you and there's just a, a flow of of rightness of of everything being okay the natural thing to do is smile help offer be generous, because that's the, that kind of shares the same energy. That's 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 what what happens when you have when you're when you're joyful when you're free. It's 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 difficult to communicate, but it's joy leads to compassion. Joy translates into compassionate action. So you smile on the street. You have nothing else to do, so you help. Did that answer your question, Kermit? Somehow? Kind of. Uh, yeah, I think you did a fairly good job of that, especially considering I was just kind of in a half-baked thought process there when you called upon me. Okay. Yeah, cool. Anyway, that's emptiness. That's, I think, uh, uh, like, there are many things that are called Nibbana or Nirvana, and that's also a separate teaching I have. I don't have it in the slides. There are especially two schools where one class of people say that Nirvana is uh, 
prolonged cessation, which is that the mind stops entirely and there is just consciousness and nothing else, and that is like for a while, feels very good and it's it's it it can be insightful. But there's this other other school which I have to say I be- belong in, which says that nibbana is the is the is the destruction of unskillful conceptualization. It's the seeing through of all conceptualization in a permanent way, so that conceptualization, sankara, are only used when necessary and only for good. So, that, for example, you know, of course, the Buddha also also conceptualized because, like, you know, if he had, you know, the Buddha knew which begging bowl was his and which robe was his, and that's sankara, this conceptualization. By its skillful conceptualization, the Buddha arguably most likely depending like based on what he said and how he thought and how he ex- described his experiences, most likely saw saw through that that this is Sankara, this is just mind made, this is not really my bowl, there's nothing there. However, his actions were compassionate. He acted and conceptualized in a way which which is necessary for communicating with people and working for good which I believe is, again, the natural reaction of the liberated heart. Um, this is like one part where I thought to, to end the whole thing, but I, I still have more stuff. So like, uh, because like, I, I think this is the apex of, 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 of insight so far, like I, I have, I have experienced, but, uh, but still like, like we'll go on because like there's a third part, <laughs> but that's very short. So uh, I'm just, I don't even know if we need a, a break. Uh, I'm crouching. <laughs> I didn't even realize. Um, uh, yeah. Let's go. Ah, oh yeah, these of course. Yeah, these are big ones. Yeah, actually, we can jump into right into the very deep end of, of classical Buddhist thinking. Some of you might have heard of dependent origination, and this is basically the, like the Buddha said: "He who sees dependent origination sees the Dhamma, and the Dhamma is the teaching. The Dhamma is." Basically, the truth in Buddhism—that's the thing. That's the under the ultimate understanding. And and now we have the tools here with all the stuff I talked about, insights and so on, and the practice and so on. We have the tools to understand, it, and I can explain this to you. So, dependent origination or pratitya samuppada in Sanskrit, it's it's pratitya samuppada. It's uh, it's basically the process how suffering arises. So first, there's ignorance, uh, which is basically our pre or already like before our the current suffering arises. It's like our preconceived notions of self, our preconceived sankaras, our preconceived kind of you know whatever like uh, our preconceived notions of of self basically. Uh, from ignorance's condition come come fabrications, which is sankaras. More sankaras arise. Like you know, we have a sense of self. We have a, we have a sense of uh, of 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 need of wants of lack of requirements, and from that arise sankaras. We we have like these uh, we fabricate uh, things like you know there's such a thing as ice cream and and I need it, and and you know that's the kind of the beginning. And we also fabricate the world. We fabricate objects. We don't understand emptiness, so we fabricate the monitor, the chair. We fabricate. We start fabricating the world. We have our fancy world that's kind of. Uh, uh, starts to be like um, uh, sliced together, uh, sliced into pieces. From fabrications or sankaras as condition comes discriminating consciousness. So discriminating consciousness or vijnana is the kind of thing where like, you know, you have your conscious field of experience and then suddenly some part of your awareness like comes to the fore- foreground. So, so for example, like um, there's a... a Sometimes it can be that you know your uh, there's a pneumatic drill. Someone's in, someone is drilling on the on the street next to your house, and you know you kind of hear it, but it's in your awareness. And you're not kind of conscious of it. You you don't pay attention to it, and then suddenly you know uh, you recognize it. Like there's ah actually there was this pneumatic drill all the time there. That's vinyana. That's discriminating consciousness. Something comes to the foreground, kind of some sliced particular part of reality. Okay, so from discriminating consciousness as, as condition, from, from vinyana, from this kind of slicing, uh, come the distinction of name and form. And form here basically pertains to suchness. It's just experience as such. Name is conceptualization. Things have names. 
you know, name and form means, you know, sometimes it's translated as, as mentality and materiality, but I, I think that's that's going going too far. It's the wrong direction. It's literally in, in Pali, it's nama rupa, which means name and form. And I think the name should be taken quite literally as concepts. So there arises the distinction of, of, of concepts and suchness. So, you know, you have suchness, but then you also have the names for things. From name and form as condition come the six sense bases. So this means that, you know, you conceptualize, you know, ah, there are seen things, there are heard things, there are touched things, there are bodily sensations, there are thoughts. In Buddhism, there's like six senses. There's, there's a, yeah, like touch, uh, sight, smell, taste, mind, and, uh, and, what's, what's, and hearing. Yeah. So, like, mind is, a, is the sixth sense in, in Buddhist thought. And you, so, basically, when you have name and form, you d- then you distinguish uh, these six different sense bases. So, from the six sense bases as condition comes contact. So, like, you know, there's, like, you know, there's seeing, and then you, you notice that, ah, I see, you know, something shiny. Like, in my, on my table, there's, like, this kind of amber rock kind of thing. Uh, I see something, and there's contact. There's contact between me and this Sankara, this fabricated fantasy object that's like a separately existing rock. And then the, yeah, there's con- like contact. From contact as condition come pleasant, negative, and neutral feelings. That's called Vedana. So, you know, when I have the contact with the rock, like, like for example, I have this amber rock, I find it quite, quite beautiful. So it's pleasant. There's a pleasant feeling associated with it. From, from feelings, from these pleasant uh, negative or neutral feelings, as condition comes craving. Okay, so if I find it pleasant, I'm like, you know, ah, I, li- I want it. Let's take it. I'll, I'll take it in my hand. You know, like, I want to feel it. You know, I like it. I very much like how it looks. I want to look at it more. From craving as condition comes clinging. You know, ah, and, and here it is like, uh, you know, I have this rock. I want to keep this rock. This this is something I want to experience again and again. You know, looking at this beautiful rock. A rock is not a, not the best example, but it could be ice cream. It could also be something negative. You know, like it could be something that you you crave the absence of something, and then and then you cling it. You know, like uh, I hope this anxiety doesn't come back. You know, like you know, if if you notice uh, from contact there arises anxiety, which is a negative feeling. It might be that you know. That from that feeling comes the craving that, you know, I want to be rid of that. And then, like, you know, from, from that craving comes the clinging that, you know, that, you know, I never want to feel this again. I, I, am, I am in a relationship to this. There's, there's a me and I, like, I hate this thing. So, yeah, basically from clinging as condition, there comes becoming, which is basically the arising of selfing. And from becoming as condition comes birth. So selfing, self, the self, self, sense of self has a reason. So, for example, if, if we take the negative example, uh, drop the rock example and take the negative example, I see something unpleasant, there's contact. From that contact, there comes the negative feeling that, you know, I hate this thing, this, this feels bad. From that bad feeling comes craving, I want to get rid of this. From that craving comes clinging. This is something I never want to, want to feel again. If I feel this for a long time, it, it, it threatens me, it's dangerous. From clinging comes becoming, the arising of, of, of selfing, and from becoming as condition comes birth. And then from, from birth as condition arises, there's this whole mass of suffering. So like, you know, when birth has, uh, has happened, then basically what, what has happened is that my mind has created this scenario that I am a person and I am currently facing a very painful thing. I am, I am a person who is suffering. So basically, Paticca Samuppada, it's, it's an old thing, and some, some researchers used to say, just call it like a mysterious old rune that doesn't really make any sense. But actually, it really it does make quite a bit of sense. It's, a, it's, a, it's an old formula for how the suffering self arises in every moment. Or like Not in every moment, but like moment to moment, you know, Tens of dozens of times per day, a hundred times per day, a thousand times per day. However, however many times per day, the suffering itself arises through this process. There's a cell, you know, the mind creates through this process a self that is in the situation of suffering. But it's purely mind-made. And the idea here is that, you know, if you can cut, 
any ch- any uh, part of this chain, the whole thing collapses and the suffering self does not arise. And usually the idea is that you c- cut it off. If you can put, uh, insert mindfulness between the Vedana, the feelings, and the positive, negative, or neutral feeling and craving, you can associate with, with mindfulness, notice that this is a positive feeling or, or negative feeling but it's actually empty, you can see through the meaning you might attribute to it, then craving might not arise, and then you can kind of... Uh, uh, the, the chain collapses. Uh, and this requires insight, of course. Uh, one good author, Buddha Dasa Bhikkhu, says that you have to have... your mindfulness has to be very fast and very constant, so that it can kind of insert that necessary insight and wisdom, remember it, in the critical part of the chain, so as to make it collapse. It's not a perfect formula, but it's interesting. And for those of you here, I know there are some of you here who are actually interested in in Buddhism and Buddhist uh, kind of classical thoughts. Uh, I think they, I just thought that they deserve some kind of explanation of this otherwise very uh, difficult rune. Here's another one, not so not so complicated, not so difficult. Five ag- aggregates. This is classical Buddhism, and at this point, this this whole talk is kind of ter- this whole talk, you know, in total, I have to say, it's kind of like a pretty in-depth introduction to Buddhism, as you might have noticed. Like that, this is uh, almost like the whole package, as far as I, I understand it, almost. But yeah, the five aggregates. This is uh, basically the Buddha said in, in Buddhism that uh, that all that exists, thusness. Uh, and again, these are just concept- conceptualizations, but this is like the Buddha conceptualized thusness into these categories. And th- this is also like the like the previous, the Patitsa Samuppada, dependent origination. This is also a way of explaining how suffering arises. So first, like there's form or rupa, which is essentially suchness. It's reality without distinctions. That's form. It, it's just, you know, it's what you experience now. It's just such. There's no distinctions, no colors, nothing such. Then there's perception, which is sanya. And sanya, kind of, it's a part of, of kind of your mental processing, which recognizes a part of reality according to previous conceptualizations, so previous sankaras. So, like, you know, there's like suchness, and then, like, you know, ah, oh, chair. It recognizes, ah, oh, there's a chair there. I, I know this. I have previously. Uh, experienced chairs have previously conceptualized that such things as chairs exist and now this uh, this uh, part of suchness here seems to accord to the pattern of a chair according to my understanding but that's sanya it recognizes and when when sanya recognizes something vinyana the discriminating consciousness it delineates that recognized part of reality clearly and brings it to the forefront of the mind so for example if i was you know like uh, if I'm this mushroom character and I was looking uh, like that way, you know, like on the on the wall, like behind Kermit there, and then like in my peripheral vision, there's a chair. Like uh, at the moment, like in my peripheral vision, there's an empty chair. It might be that, you know, I'm looking at the wall, but my sanya perception recognizes, ah, there's a chair here. Hey, look. And then Vinyana brings it to the fore. It's like, you know, wow, hey, chair. And then it, then it delineates that, you know, yes, this thing... Bring it to the forefront of consciousness. And then, like, basically, in Patitsa Samuppada, independent origination, at this point, contact would arise. But, like, this is a same, more simpler list. Then there's, like, a feeling tone or valence, which is the Vedana. It's, like, the feeling of positive, negative, or neutral that attaches to the perceived object. So, yeah. I see the chair. Sanya recognizes it. Vinyana brings it to the forefront. And then Vedana kicks in. Is this nice? Or bad or just meh and the chair is kind of meh you know like it is neutral but for some person it might be like you know if, if their chair you know they have a phobia of chairs they would be like you know ah oh, chair and it's, it's negative uh and then based on that you know further fabrication sankaras uh you know there's either a creation of new ones or a reinforcement of 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 old or further conceptual distinction so like based on that i see the chair and and that can re- reinforce my like my whole mass of conceptualization about you know if, if if the feeling tone is negative or chairs are scary to me I have a chair phobia it's like you know ah oh, chairs are st- scary and 
and it's being reinforced. You know, there's a thing like as, as, as like a chair, uh, and it's and it's scary and dangerous and so on. Or there might be new conceptualizations that arise from that, and uh, whatever kind of thinking that might arise. There's like a, like the whole mass of thoughts that would arise concerning the, the chair is also just like a mass of sankaras. Basically, thinking is formed very much of conceptualization conceptualization which are, are sankaras. So like, you know, that's like the five aggregates. So like, again, for those who are classically inclined, you know, that's one explanation of, of the five aggregates. And also one explanation of how uh, basically, like, it, it's also like a feedback loop. Uh, Sanya works according to previous sankaras. It perceives things. And then when you go through the whole thing, then, you know, uh, there's a creation and reinforcement of of, of some cars and like you know new, new some cars are created and and you know there's further conceptual distinctions, which then again uh, feed into perception and inform perception, and yeah, then you know the whole thing kind of goes again and again, and that's kind of one one version of how some cars are created and kind of how how they're maintained. Okay, so this is like the end of part two. That was like you know about the insights of Buddhism. Uh, and kind of, you know, yeah, according to my understanding so far. Um, at this point, I would like to ask, you know, do you have any questions? Well, I have at least one, but let's see if anybody else has anything uh, first. Anything at all, folks? Any comments uh, or I might thoughts have a or questions? Question. All right, go for it, Joe. For a thought. Um, Question is mostly, uh, I'm having, you already said that this is kind of difficult to conceptualize, but the idea of losing form itself uh, uh, in your mind to kind of like encapsulate this nothingness, or rather this uh, oneness uh, sensation, is this... um, does this have a corresponding like jhana in which this is related to, or is this just a so abstract it's its own thing? Uh, like I, I'm having trouble wrapping my head around it, so I'm trying to think of things that I can connect it to, so I can get more mm-hmm. insight into what it means. Yeah. So I, it's yeah. not so much a question; it's more of a statement, I suppose. So yeah, but you're interested if there's like a state, like a jhana state that's mm-hmm. kind of. Yeah, there is no um, uh, distinct jhana state that relate to this particularly. Uh, but jhana states can reinforce, you know, because they, you know, they uh, uh, undermine selfing and so on. They can, they can, and they they undermine conceptualization, so they can bring this about. But uh, you know, the formless jhana, for example, they none of them have this as their particular object. Perhaps the eighth jhana, which I personally have to say I have I have not reached ever, but that's like uh, the state of like uh, a neither perception nor non-perception, which which has as its object something that has no characteristics so at all. Yeah, uh, the object of the object of the of the eighth jhana does not, you know, it has no characteristics that you can name, but it's something. So it's something that's nothing, and in a sense, thusness is like that. And this actually brings me to a good point. Uh, oh, approach. Many of the of the uh, people here, like some, have perhaps heard of such a thing of, like, as the Heart Sutra, which begins with the words, the classical, very cryptic words of "form is emptiness and emptiness is form." And basically, uh, what this means, uh, like this, this was very cryptic for me for a long time. And by the way, I apologize. I notice I'm getting slightly tired. Uh, after all this, and my mind isn't working quite as fast as before. But um, basically, yeah, there is form, there is rupa, there is suchness. Something is there, but it's actually, but it's nothing. You can't say anything about it. Anything you say about it, any single thing, uh, is untrue. Uh, it doesn't apply. If you want to, any single thought you have about reality and it being some way or it being something, or some some part of it being something, is untrue. It doesn't apply. There are so, you know, like a, a very kind of more superficial 
way of understanding this is this is that you know if you say there's such a thing as yellow in fact every single so-called yellow thing is is a different hue of yellow there's like you know they're not the same yellow but even if they were the same yellow whenever you say that this is yellow that's a conceptualization and that doesn't exist that's that's if you have a thought so, about reality that that distinguishes something from something else, you conceptualize. The only thing you can see about things is is that it's such, and that's how you know form is emptiness. No form is you know there's it's nothing. It's nothing in particular. Like like that's maybe a better better way to put it. Form is nothing in particular. But then emptiness is form. You know it's it still exists. It's such, and thusness is empty, but it exists. That's that actually kinda... does help. Cool, um, wonderful. Because it makes sense to me that no- nothingness can only just be, and the second you try to grasp it and put it into a box, up oh, that's a form. And it's like you could keep mm-hmm. grasping at nothing, and then you'll just keep on pulling out forms, kind of like a magic trick. <laughs> You're like, yeah. what's in this hat? Nothing. Oh, actually. And then you just keep pulling things out of it. Um, mm-hmm. The only way you can accept it is to just have it be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a nice Zen story. Like, Zen emphasizes this very much because Zen is Mahayana-oriented. Like, the Heart Sutra, for example, is one of the foundational texts of, of Zen, or Chan, as it was in China uh, originally, I think. There's uh, one Chan uh, tale, a very simple kind of tale, where like uh, a monk approached his master and said, that, you know, Master, I finally understand that everything is just a dream. Nothing exists. Well, the master has a t- took a stick and gave a good solid whack on the head of the monk, you know. And, the, and, and then the, you know, asked, like, you know, yeah, does that, like, does this not exist? And then the monk is like, you know, okay, I, oh, it hurts. So sorry, master, I'm, I, I was wrong. Actually, everything exists. And what the monk, what the master does is, you know, he gives another solid whack to the, the monk, you know, <laughs> because he he says, you know, it it, it it's beyond existence or, or non-existence. It's just such like, it, it's not a dream because it's there, but it, it's any kind of idea of the world you can have, any kind of view on anything, any kind of name on anything you can you can say is is a fantasy world you're living in a fantasy world and that that's kind of that's how it's nothing you know yeah, it doesn't that. exist in that sense anything you can say doesn't exist i have a thought about but that. something exists and that's such that's yeah. to maybe the one thing that goes around here quite a, a bunch is uh something that came up in robert anton wilson's work not sure if you're familiar but this idea the map is not the territory you know, whenever you conceptualize something mm-hmm. again, you're you're describing something that goes beyond whatever um, uh, a concept you come up with, or even the means that you have to conceptualize. You know, we're very limited in all sorts of ways. So, yeah, it can never mm-hmm. really be the. Um, and it also reminds me, kind of, um, again, not sure how familiar you are, or if it is even is related. Um, how in Jewish uh, theology, you know, um, they're very, in, in other uh, religious as well, they're very much against um, giving certain shapes or forms to uh, divine things, you know, because again, doing so risks uh, creating kind of like, a, well, I guess they even use the word far, false idol, right? Like you, you become so focused on, on this thing, your concept, that you just l- lose touch with this thing, which is far beyond the concept, you know, which... Again, the concept is only the 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 boat to get you across the the river and uh, mm. and so on. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Those were just some thoughts that came up. Uh, maybe it's it's relevant yeah. to you. It's for sure. It's it, it's related. Yeah, yeah. The map is not 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 the territory. It's just you know, yeah. In anything is a map. You know, anything you. Anything your mind creates is a sankara. Everything is a map, and none of that is the territory. So you know, the only thing you can do is you just you just go with the flow. In a sense, you just live with the territory. You do what you do. You know, again, the the old Chan you know story. You know, before awakening, you chop wood and you carry firewood. 
after awakening you chop wood and carry firewood you know it's 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 just you know nothing changes except that you know you just you just live there there's no question of of anything there's no question of anything anything at all it's just unfolding and that's that's it that's and it's beautiful. It and it's liberated. It's 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 very beautiful. It's it's just it's just wonderful. I try to view things as an alchemical process, and that you're just kind of along for the ride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. You're along for the ride, and you know there might be all kinds of magical, weird. Like none of this discounts any kind of you know religious attitude in in any sense. You know whether there's like a uh, a coordinating principle, you know, in 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 the world that's kind of you know uh, creates synchronicities or whatever doesn't matter. Like even if there's a you know there is a god in quotation marks, God is also suchness. It's just you know it, it's not God. It's just it's just how it is, you know. And that that thing that things are just as they are and they can't be any other way and they are they are as they are right now and that's it. Period. You know. That's that's liberation, I feel. Yeah, hey, question. Uh, so with the term, the territory is not the map, and the map is not the territory, I think it would be more fair to say that the map is similar to the territory, and vice versa. But in what way is the concept of yellow, for example, similar to what you see? through experience of what seems similar to it, correct? Or the illusion of what seems similar? Through association? But are they actually similar? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> are they actually similar? If you have a... If you name something as yellow, is the conceptualization like... Um, how is that similar? Like, or like, really, if you take it as a conceptualization, you know, that's a name. Name for something. Does it actually resemble, like, phenomenologically or actually, like, in any ontological or any way, does it resemble the object? Or, like, the, it's not even the object, but the, the total experience you're experiencing at that time. Like you, what happens, I think, is that you notice that there are your mind kind of in a very culturally um, affected way notices similarities, so so called similarities between things, and it creates a concept for those. You know, there's this and this thing, and they kind of look the same, so they're yellow. And of course, it's very good to to realize that in some cultures, as many of you might know, uh, in Japan for a long time there was no no word for blue. Uh, things weren't really blue; they were green. In some cultures, there's no like in some tribal jungle cultures, uh, there is no word other than dark and light because there's you know, and they don't perceive differences between you know like if something is light blue or light light green. I mean, it's it's just light, and they have a very big, like much trouble distinguishing between those that we find obviously dissimilar. It, the thing is that perception, in a very, very fundamental way, is in, in philosophy of science it would be said that it's theory laden. But that's kind of a, a, uh, maybe a, a too theoretical word in itself. But it's kind of you know, before perception, before our perception of similarity, there's all, all already conceptualization. Conceptualization informs sanya. It informs perception. So, are are uh, are you basically saying is so uh, we develop the faculties to be able to kind of conceptualize and relate, um, you know, to, to identifying things to their alchemical process simply so we can relate it to our own evolution? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I mean we we the reasons for conceptualization are you know like uh, like biological imperatives might. Is spiritual imperatives in in some way, like uh, like you said, like you know, could be like an like I said, an, an alchemical internal process, whatever. The imperatives come from many different places, but 
for sure a lot of it comes from biological imperatives i think you know it's it's um we are quite hardwired for selfing for example and for conceptualizing that's that's how we how we function mentally that uh, the problem is that that conceptualization is the root of all of our problems. Or like it, it, it's it's the root of all suffering. And I would actually say that humans, uh, even uh, there are many things in humans that like have evolved very in a very unfortunate way. One of course is you know a narrow pelvis and a big head, as as everyone knows, makes it makes giving birth extremely painful. Um, but I think another one is you know our like our cerebral cortex. Uh, is so complicated and so so powerful that our psychological and mental functioning has many bugs and glitches and many unfortunate things. The very very fact that someone can can commit commit suicide, I think, or like someone get can get depressed, it's, it's obviously in a sense you could say a bug. It, it's not you know it's it's an unfortunate result of of different feedback mechanisms in our, in our brains in, and in, in, in our minds. And it's kind of, you know, we function in a very unoptimal way. Uh, and that's a very crude and not very appealing way to put it, but I think, like, you know, it, it's also a valid way to put it, in a sense. We, we, our mental functioning is, unfortunately, the root of a lot of suffering and, and problems and so on. And without... Like with less conceptualizing, with seeing through conceptualizing, and with more skillful and let's say minimal conceptualizing, we just you know there's no problem. It's in it's in itself it's a panacea. It it cures everything because we don't conceptualize problems anymore. That's um. I almost picked up during the whole um map and territory thing and said you know it's it's really just you taking a picture and passing it through the filter that is like your entire collective life that still doesn't mean that that picture is accurate of what is actually there mm. that's all yeah. i have. agreed all right well i think hexa is sending me the question uh oh there it is what are your thoughts between your relationship of no self and people with DID or split personalities. So DID is, is it like dissociative identity disorder? Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, well, like I'm not sure, like about DID to be honest, but like uh, there is this <clears throat> one phenomenon that that I have discussed with some other people at some point is that there are some. I'm not sure if these are related. Like DID, okay, well, let's talk DID first. Definitely they could be insightful as to no self, you know. There are several different, let's say, crudely, programs in the mind system that are kind of like have to do with narratives of self and conceptualizations of self. It's like we all have like, like on top of our moment-to-moment -moment sense of self and me and mine and, you know, ownership and stuff and agency, there we have a lot of set sankaras or like 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 beliefs about what we are and what we do and and, and how we function and are we ethical are, are we good like what what do we do in certain situations autopilot things all of those and I, I would think like one perhaps naive I, I'm not an expert but one way to put DID would be perhaps to say that there are several sets of these conceptualizations several sets of these frameworks and processes that kind of you know can shift to each other so you know. People with DID can, you know, have several identities and several senses, several selfhoods, several concepts of me that are like, uh, like, very different from from each other and involve very different behavioral, you know, uh, attitudes and kind of habits and so on. So I think observing that change could be very insightful for no self, as you know, like none of these these can change. They are not necessarily linked to me, you know, like they. This whole thing can change, but I could, I also want to say uh, about you know I'm not sure if that happens with DID, but with some depersonalization and derealization uh, kind of uh, symptoms, some uh, sometimes people feel something like that's phenomenologically akin to uh, effortless action or like basically uh, resting in a no self state. So like you know they can feel like they're not moving their body and they can feel like you know all this stuff. 
um, that meditators feel. Uh, but the the major distinction is that usually in those. I just want to say this also as a general point. Now that it came to my mind, that in those disorders, the uh, selflessness and effortlessness is usually feels chaotic and anxiety-inducing, and uh, behavior behavior seems to be controlled by unconscious motivations that are unclear. And the same is in, in schizophrenia and psychosis, where people also have these feelings feelings of no agency and so on, where uh, behavior seems to be controlled by we could even say archetypal material. I'm a bit of a Jungian, so like I, I, I kind of uh, interpret that as like a possession of, let's say, very strong unconscious material. Um, but, the same, but yeah, there can be phenomena that resemble several very insightful states, uh, meditative states, but they usually have these uh, differences that, you know, in disorders, in psychological disorders, they are usually anxiety-inducing, hellish, very confusing, feeling chaotic, feeling like you have no control over anything. Um, yeah, so in this part two of the presentation, we've seen lo lots of the, um, what I appreciate about Buddhism, you know, the way that they define language for things that are hard to talk about. For people who might be, you know, very new to this kind of stuff, it might seem like um, uh, a challenge they cannot overcome, you know, to make meaningful sense of all these words and all these different things and so on. So what is your uh, suggestion for people who are interested in, you know, learning the system and the details and the words and all that, but might be a little put off by how, how big of a mountain it is? Well, like, of course, it takes time. I mean, uh, what, what I basically aim, aim to do in this presentation is I'm giving, like, I did these slides in in I think like two days and uh, and uh, I I have tried to give a good uh, thought provoking description of pretty much the core things in, in in Buddhist thought. However, it's obvious that you know of course we, no one can get like everything from one package and it, it requires there's a kind of like a hermeneutic circle like uh, or, or spiral which means like um, you know. In 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 Buddhist practice, like basically, it means that you, if you want to understand the the thing very well, you need first hand experience, and, and and you need also to study. So it's like you, you you can hear something like this talk, then you meditate, you study, you meditate, you study, you meditate, you study. You kind of you 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 have your first hand experience. You meditate, you contemplate, you allow things to simmer, and you return to the material, not the same presentation, but like similar similar material. And you understand a little bit more de more deeply. Then you meditate more, you let it simmer. Then you come back to the to the, to the study. You understand again a bit more deeply. And the study also informs your meditation, and they form this kind of reciprocal kind of spiral. Or like whenever you can return to the same material after practicing, you understand a, a new layer of it. And then you come back, you go back, practice with that new information, and then again, you know, it's a reciprocal connection, and it, it takes time. And for those people who feel that it's like an insurmountable mountain, you know, it's not insurmountable, but it requires you to study and practice. You can't. It's very difficult. I mean, I, I'm doing my best, <laughs> but it's very difficult to to kind of get all of that in one in, in one go. You have to maybe not commit yourself to it, but you have to. Uh, allow your whatever motivation has sparked in you uh, from your initial kind of uh, observation of that stuff or like your, your initial uh, contact with the stuff. You have to allow that spark of motivation to bloom and blossom and nurture it slightly and actually start, start practicing. There's no, you know, there's no... What's the word, you know? Well, there's no easy way out. You know? There's no cut-off path. There's no, you know, whatever. Yeah, for sure. And maybe one more thing to add to that, you know, what, like what, what, I guess you already went over it a bit at the start, you know, but what was really for you the moment where you realized like, oh, right, so this thing, it's not only just a whole bunch of information that might be s interesting to some people, but, you know, here's my reason that I just realized that I'm going to pursue this great body of, of, of information and practices and so on. Was there any particular thing that made it click for you or 
or like gave you the motivation? Well, uh, there were several moments. The first one was when I was in Thailand. I was traveling there uh, in in 2014, and uh, there were old Buddhist temples in Sukhothai, Ayutthaya. There were these like old old Siam was Buddhist, and there were like these these old uh, old temples. And I was reading the Dhammapada, which I recommend to everyone very heartily if you're interested in Buddhism and haven't read anything. The Dhammapada, it's not very deep, but it's very, there are so many really poetic translations. It's like a collection of sayings of the Buddha, and it's very beautiful. And I read it in Buddhist temples, old Buddhist temples, with very nice, lovely ambient music from, from, a, from an artist called Ishku, which means love in Arabic, like a love, love of a cre- create, creature for its creator, and very kind of a wonderful ambient music with very spiritual meaning. And uh, and and it just and it clicked for me. I went for a three-day retreat in Thailand, which felt very long to me back then. I didn't understand anything of the practice or the instructions, but I did something, and that the bug bit me kind of. The second turning point came when I went to the Goenka retreat. Practice, ten-day retreat, ten days of intensive practice. I got my first sober experiences, let's say, of of. Of uh, of lessened agency, not no agency, but lessened agency and bliss, like uh, like a kind of meditative bliss. Very important, but maybe the, fa- the the greatest turning point was when I learned the jhanas in 2018 uh, October. I went on my final Goenka retreat. Like I said, I had the Lee Brazington's book under my pillow. I read it. I practiced furiously, got into the first jhanas, the, the first and second and third jhanas, and got the first proper big experiences of no self and not just lesson but no agency. I was then just you know like uh, like this is where it's at. This is this is in, this is incredible. This is uh this changes everything. I mean it, it's and it's you have to have the practical experience. I mean, you can't... Study is incredibly important as, as well. Some teachers say that, you know, don't read books, just practice. I think that's, that's not, not good. I mean, you should also study because there is this kind of reciprocal connection. But you need to practice. Otherwise, you, you, you will never get it. I, I don't think you can ever get it if you, if you, don't, if you don't have the first-hand experience that, that you notice and see that, that, that I don't exist. Like, like, it's that experience that, you know... It's it's gone. It's gone. It really is gone. It's not just intellectual, you know, you know that uh, yeah, it, it seems rational to think and you know cognitively acceptable that you know probably there is no separate self, blah blah. It's that you actually experience it. The uh, the aha moment is so much greater and it can't be replaced by any any reading or anything. So you have to practice. You have to practice relatively diligently, daily, preferably, uh, and. Start small, but you have to accept that it's a long path. But the thing is, with practice, don't, it's don't be goal oriented. That's super important to all practitioners here in this room. Do not be goal oriented. That kills your practice. Don't don't look for awakening. Awakening is nonsense. Awakening is a concept. It doesn't exist. If you're aiming, people who aim for awakening, they're they're looking. Uh, at something that they don't even know what what it is, like uh, towards something like that, they're they're you know they're, they're they're looking past what's actually there, which is reduction of suffering. Like I said, Buddhism is about having a good time, reducing suffering for yourself and for others. And uh, and you should and the, and the way to achieve that is to enjoy your path as it is currently. Apply the methods, practice diligently, explore, get insight, enjoy the process, and that's the way you get somewhere. If you if you practice with high standards and that you want to get somewhere, you'll never get there. It, it's, it doesn't work. You'll be unsatisfied. You'll be disappointed. Your practice will fall apart. So method-oriented is, is, is important. Um, exploration is important. Uh, yeah, basically that's the that's the 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 important things. I I feel like I have to say on, say on that right now. Daily, preferably, uh, and 